for or send their children overseas in most cases. Um, and so I, um, I myself am quite um, I'm, or, uh, partial to the arguments that are brought up by some of the figures that I mentioned earlier um, and am overall convinced that violence does breed violence. And we are, I mean, um, a, a, we, are, we head down a slippery slope when we, when we kind of grab the gun as our first response. Um, and we can see that in the kind of uh, dissolution of the situation within some Muslim, situ some Muslim states, such as in Pakistan or in Iraq or in Algeria, where um, you know you have first the enemy is outside, then the enemy is inside, right? And then, and then, I mean, the definition of the us becomes smaller, and the definition of the them becomes wider. And um, I just, uh, I think that it's as, as um, Maulana Wahiduddin Khan says, um, that we are, we need to somehow break out of a mentality of violence, or the one that glorifies war and glorifies the warrior. Um, so that's kind of where I stand on things. When we were planning this, we thought it was important to move the discussion, uh, at, at least at one point, from the, uh, the broad to the personal because ultimately this is personal. Um, but on back to the impersonal, uh, Dr. Azam, can you give us the real story about the 72 virgins? Oh. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't exactly know the real story of the 72 virgins. I, uh, it's one of those things that's thrown around a lot, as we know, or as we don't know. Um, it's not in the Quran, that is for, sh for sure. And it is also not, um, this is the it, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is the idea that the martyr um, will be greeted in paradise by 72 virgins, all for himself. I've never read it in the reverse. I don't know if the female martyr gets 72 virgin men all to herself, but the assumption is that it's always the men who get the 72 female virgins. Um, it's, and it's not in the, in the canonical collections of hadith. Tirmidhi. It's in Tirmidhi. Okay, so I guess. Um, One place, weak. <laughs> so it's, and it's regarded as weak. I don't know, I don't know about that. But I know, it's, I know it's not in like Bukhari or Muslim or Malik or one of the kind of higher rated hadith collections. Um, on the other hand, there is again, this idea that martyrs are, will be granted paradise, and we do see that in the Quran. And we also see in the Quran um, mention that um, the inhabitants of paradise will, or, or that those who attain to paradise will um, find for themselves companions who are uh, hur, which means dark-eyed. Um, and so, I don't know exactly how dark-eyed works to virgin, but that's the, um, and there, there is, there are little bits in the Quran that kind of Im imply that one would find companions. They're described as companions, dark of eye, similar of age. I heard that there was one minority. No virginal status is mentioned or, or anything like that. I'm I sorry. heard that there was one minor uh, interpretation of that, that actually horror mean white grapes, which will disappoint a whole lot of people, I think. White uh, grapes? White grapes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, what I learned about that tradition, if I can interpose, is that in the Islamic tradition, there are a number of collections of reports of what the Prophet did, or the Prophet Muhammad uh, did or said at particular times. And there are some that are widely respected and some that are less important. And in one of those less important uh, collections, there is a single report, a hadith they're called, in which the 72, 72 virgins are, um, in which this report is given. The traditions are all evaluated in terms of whether they're uh, strong. They're very likely to be something that uh, Muhammad said or did. People are very sure about that. And some where the reports are highly suspect. And this is one of the highly suspect reports. But it's gotten a certain amount of uh, traction 
among people who are looking for reasons to justify uh, martyrdom. Okay. Um, if the <coughs> we've heard a lot about the rules of warfare and the traditions and the and the guidance. What happens to someone who doesn't follow the rules? What is the punishment if, after all the sages and theologians of our traditions have come up with this very calibrated uh, judgment as to what makes a conflict legit or illegit, uh, what if they, what if somebody breaks the rule? Is there a, have they talked as much about the consequences of breaking the rule? Yes, Dr. Garcia. If you limit it in terms of just war, tradition, if you break the rules, you will have an inclination probably of doing a number of things. One of them will be to develop a type of crusade mentality. That is, there, there is no limit to the way I exercise violence. And there is no limit to the infliction of pain. And I don't have to discriminate against to whom I do it. Or you can engage in a terrorist kind of mentality, which is there is no necessary goal I have to achieve. And there is no purpose to what I'm doing. I'm just going to inflict as much evil as I can, because the enemies I'm fighting are enemies of the divine, and therefore they don't have worth whatsoever. That is, the, the punishment we pay, I think, the Christian tradition has been right on this. The punishment about that type of sin is that we have to live with it. And what we live with is a, a human context in which community becomes impossible. And, if in, and in which violence is rampant. And that's a horrendous price to pay for not abiding by some of these rules. Okay. Thank you. Rabbi um, well, as I said, for, for thousands of years, these were purely theoretical. So uh, there, there was no punishment to be meted out. But the punishment within Judaism always is the, the possibility of cherem, or of being excommunicated, which is to be isolated as Dr. Garcia said, to be apart from your community. But also, uh, I think as well, what, uh, what Dr. Azam ma made reference to with the, the, the detritus that comes out uh, with, with war, uh, Golda Meir said, I think it was to, to Sadat, uh, before the Israel-Egypt uh, peace accords, said, she said, we can forgive you for killing our sons, but we can never forgive you for making us kill your sons. That the effect that, a, that, that uh, that violating these these conventions of war have on the individual, even if there is no um, even if there is no physical punishment meted out, uh, the, psych the psychological effect is, is very strong. And now the only place in the world really where where this is applicable is the state of Israel, where there is an equivalent of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So you do get in trouble uh, if you if you violate uh, if if you violate the 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 uh, Jewish law that is part of of Israeli civil law. Um, so um, I will speak then to the otherworldly consequences, which um, are, are also something to be kept in mind. Um, well, actually, uh, this. Well, let me talk about this worldly briefly, because I, mean, I think the the consequences are things that my co-panelists have brought up. But um, because Islamic law kind of. Um, a, was developed assuming a court system and a state uh, enforcement's capability. Um, a person who is shown to have um, unjustly taken life or rebelled against the state or d decide to go off and conduct a war, a war effort or military action on his own or with a handful of followers or something would be considered to have violated the laws of jihad. Um, and if, you're, if you kill somebody and if it's not jihad, then it's murder. So then you are in trouble for committing um,